to start off with a panel this morning uh, related to deals in the industry. It's interesting that I think a lot of the investors are a little bit uh, perhaps uh, unhappy with the fact that there's no $8 billion bolt-on uh, this morning to kind of get things started on the M&A side of things. But obviously, M&A is a huge issue, uh, as well as deals in general. And, and the last three or four days, really the last week, has been just extraordinary. I think everybody tries to track deal making and trends in the industry with their own metrics as well as the ones that are provided to them. Um, and uh, my metric is news flow. And news flow on deals is just being gotten steeper and steeper and steeper and steeper and steeper every year. Um, so we may not have had the, the $8 billion deal, but we've certainly seen a huge number of small, smaller deals. In fact, uh, three members of this panel, maybe four actually, uh, have deals out this morning that we can be talking about as well. So I wanted to introduce everybody on the panel. I've known everybody here for years. Ari Beldegren. Uh, Ari does a lot of different things um, at Allogene. At, uh, and formerly of Kite, of course, where he did a major deal, um, and at Vita Ventures, as well as in the real estate side of things. Um, so you could talk, to, say that Aries really got his thumb on a whole lot of different pulses related to the industry right now. To his left is Josh Belenker. Uh, Josh works for Eli Lilly now. He got bought out at Loxo about a year ago, right? And uh, is staying. Uh, to do the oncology group, kind of moving from one side of the table to the other side of the table, and I think has a lot of different perspectives as it relates to what's going on right now. To his left, uh, Stefan, uh, CEO of Moderna. Um, Stefan Bansell has uh, spent, ten, how many years now at Moderna? Uh, eight, since the beginning, eight. Eight years, since the very beginning. Uh, struck a huge number of deals, large deals, at the very beginning on a preclinical side. And that's another aspect that we're going to be talking about today. Then Vivek Ramaswamy, who has never stopped doing deals, probably is doing a deal as we speak, <laughs> texting somebody. And Marianne DeBacher from Bayer. Um, Marianne had earlier been at J&J, has done over 200 deals organize more than 200 deals from a big pharma perspective. So a lot of different perspectives here about what's going on. I'm gonna take my seat now. So I wanted to really focus this conversation on trends in the industry right now. Where you see this going. I think in 2019, everybody could agree that we had an intense burst of M&A, um, some involved here with that. We had a tremendous amount of deal making, perhaps not quite as much deal making overall, uh, in 2019 and 2018, but uh, still a huge amount of work going on. And I think everyone's thinking about how 2020 is going to play out, where the valuations are going to be, what kinds of deals are going to be done, how companies are operating, how they're focusing, and so on. So I wanted to throw this out here at the beginning in terms of where you see the deal-making tempo over the course of 2020. Um, do you see this as something where we're going to continue at the same level? Do we see different types of deals? What, what are we going to, where are we going to be seeing in the year ahead? Ari? <clears throat> well, first, uh, thanks for the invitation to be on the, um, on the, on the panel. Well, I cannot predict again uh, what will be, whether it would be greater, same, or a little bit less, but there are some trends that are unstoppable. When I look at uh, the last recession, 2008, 2009, when we did deals, because we had to, because we thought that the world is coming apart and uh, there would be no money in biotech, we are in a different stage now. It's all about cutting edge science. Science is uh, developing in a rapid pace with genomics medicine, with cell therapy, with gene therapy. Uh, it's unstoppable. So I think whatever you say here, is one thing, but uh, life science is here for a great, um, <clears throat> a great run. And if it will not be in, two, in 2020, it will be in 21. You cannot stop the trend that's going on. 
Well, let's pick that up. Does anybody else have any particular perspective as it relates to what's going on in 2020? Josh, I mean, obviously, you've got a lot of different plans that you've been working on. In addition to new deals, I mean, there are some X deals, you know, in terms of focus and how people are focusing in on so uh, certain different aspects of what they're working on. I, I am, I am kind of curious, just like maybe there's more of a universal perspective on your part as it relates to what you're likely, or what we're likely to see as a group, as an industry. I mean, for R&D stage assets, medicines that are emerging in the pipeline, I, I think it's a very, obviously, drug-specific insight that drives an R&D team and a search and evaluation team to transact. And that's more of a local phenomenon than a macro phenomenon. And, and there's always appetite in pharma to do that. If, if there's an asset that's interesting, uh, go get it. Uh, and as the secondary follow-on financing market softens, I think the leverage shifts a bit to the ability to transact on an asset level basis. And in terms of wholesale M&A, company acquisition, or certainly commercial stage M&A, I think a, a, a lot of that, I think people are gonna watch pricing uncertainty in the political debate we're having in an election year. And I think um, people are looking at, at valuations a, as it relates to NPV and thinking about value. I would just add that, I mean, I agree with Ari. I mean, the level of innovation that is happening is just mind-blowing, right? And from a big pharma perspective, obviously we want to, to partner with the best and the brightest in the industry. And when we were talking about it a year ago, everyone thought, you know, we were going to move from a seller's market to a buyer's market. And we have absolutely not seen that, right? There's so much capital available, despite the fact that there's so much innovation that needs capital. Uh, and if you look at you know, the number of IPOs last year, there's a lot of companies that really don't need to partner, at least not initially, and can you know, go to the public markets to, to find financing. Right, everybody's so, got a perspective right? on that because there are a lot of different sources of money now compared to say nine, or nine years ago, exactly. it was just like there were, there were no yes. sources of money. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very difficult to go. Now it's just completely the opposite side. There's deal making, there's IPOs. There are, there are a variety of different ways to get money, to gin money up. So, but at the same time, I am kind of curious whether we're going to see any dips or changes in those overall trends, whether we're going to see any sort of shifts towards one thing or another. It doesn't seem possible for me to see another year of M&A like this year for no other reason than, there, you know, it's unlikely we'll see another Celgene acquisition, something of that size. But on the other hand, maybe, maybe we will see that. So what do you think? Uh, I have a few comments to make. I think that when I, I'm reminded of the period of time that Ari mentioned about a decade ago when the environment was very different than it is today. And I think that we cannot comment upon the deal-making environment without first keeping in mind the macro business cycle and where we sit within that cycle. And I think that back in 2007, 2008, that's when I got started for example, as my first career as an investor in the industry, I remember someone telling me that we would never see companies like Gilead and Amgen and Biogen, and at that time, Genzyme spawned again, because the thing that created those companies were permissive capital markets in the late 90s as part of the tech and life sciences boom and then the subsequent life sciences bubble thereafter that provided cheap capital to really fuel the growth of great companies, and we were gonna see an industry that was segmented into smaller companies, forced into doing deals with larger companies, and that would be the new value chain. And I think that that has since proven superlatively wrong, but not because of, I think, fundamental, not just because of fundamental changes in scientific innovation, I think that's an important part of it, but we have lived in a decade of low interest rate environments that dragged us out of the financial crisis and have dragged us into a place where I think this is a good thing, but have created the possibilities for companies to organically have enough access to capital resources to build the next generation of Gilead and Biogen and Amgen and Genentech on their own from scratch. And I think that in, against that backdrop, when I think about deal making in... Uh, in, maybe you disagree, uh, in, uh, in, in, start throwing things. in 2020, look, I think that, I, I just go back to first principles in that, look, father of American, father of modern capitalism, Adam Smith, made a very simple observation. This is painfully obvious, but worth remembering that a good deal, the wealth of nations is not that different than the wealth of companies. There's a comparative advantage between two entities. You don't, you can't be great at everything, 
And if some people are great at some things and other people are great at other things, the hallmark of a good deal is when those two parties work together. And I think at a healthy part of where we are in the cycle, which is I think where we are right now, you see deals that reflect that principle. And I think where the bellwether will be rung, the top of that cycle, where we ought to be worried is when the deals that people start doing no longer observe that principle, where you have people that don't have any comparative advantage with respect to one another still working together just because they have resources to deploy or, or an urge to do a deal. And I predict we're gonna get there in the next couple of years. I don't think we're there now. I think the kinds of deals we're seeing in the last couple of years reflect the basic principle of comparative advantage. But I think that over the next couple of years in the urge to continue the chase to be doing deals and chasing growth for the sake of growth, I think we're gonna start to see uh, you know, a turn where people have already maximized comparative advantage, and, and I think that that would be the time to be worried, but I don't think that that's 2020. So, Stefan, you raised how much money to, to get Moderna to where it is right now? Uh, around three billion. Three billion. Can you do that again? I mean, it, or, it, I think that a lot of, uh, no, I, I, I'm kind of curious. <laughs> I think your focus right now is on clinical trials, right, and, 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 and data more than... <laughs> but I am kind of curious. I mean, if somebody else were to start a company like Moderna right now, would it be just as easy or, or easier, perhaps, to raise $3 billion for it? Because I've heard that it is. It's, it's tough to really know, but the, the piece I think that was unique to Moderna is from the very first day, we believe that if we were right, if we could figure out how to do the science correctly, this would be a new class of medicine. We never built this company thinking it was going to be one drug. And so we said, let's not be too smart. We don't know where this is going to work best. Biology is very complicated, as we all know, and I've learned the hard way. So we said, we're going to try six different applications of a technology to de-risk the technology like people do when they do portfolio of assets. And for every application, because there's always a biology risk. We're gonna try several drugs in that application, and we're gonna see what science tells us. We're gonna go take all those 20 drugs into the clinic and gonna see what science tells us. And we did that because what was very clear from a science standpoint is if any of those drugs were gonna work and make it to market, it made no sense this was gonna be a one-drug company. Because mRNA is information-based, it was gonna be either zero, and everybody on the team was very clear this could fail because there's no mRNA drug approved, of course, or this could be dozens and dozens of drugs, and we're, of course, playing for that game. And what we spend a lot of time doing is finding investors that are the same vision that we had. We told them, if you want us to pick a drug and to take one to the clinic and to use as little capital as we can, do not buy the stock. This is not what we're doing, because we are not smart enough to figure out the best application of mRNA over time. Now, times are very different, uh, as we announced yesterday, we are doubling down on our vaccines, on our IV systemic. We're entering autoimmune disease because now we've got the clinical signal we are looking for and we're just piling capital on new assets. We build a manufacturing plant that we launched 18 months ago so we can scale. So it's a very different game, but in the early days, I think it depends on what you're trying to do and finding the right partners. Same thing with AstraZeneca and Merck. You know, our first partnership with Astra, we got $240 million cash up front but people forgot that we gave them 40 drug slots because that's what they wanted and they could really explore the technology. They now have three drugs in development. They have more they are working on uh, in the labs. And so the math was that if they got one drug out, they were gonna be happy. So we'll see. So I am curious about, maybe we could kind of break this down a little bit more carefully in terms of you know where the valuations are right now. I think uh, over the last few years, it's fair to say that cancer and rare diseases became a huge focus for everyone. Um, you see right now in cancer where everybody opens a door, there'll be a dozen different companies that rush through it. It is a, probably very difficult. It, it's so competitive right now, but also the, the competition for these assets is extraordinarily high as well. So the valuations there have been going up. With rare diseases, I think it's fair to say you do a phase two study, you go straight to the FDA, you can arrange that. It doesn't cost $3 billion to do that. You've got a drug, you're out on the market, you're doing these things. I, there's a whole different discussion about whether small companies do commercialization right early on, but I, I think that you know, you're seeing those areas that are really hot, and at the same time, areas like women's health, which you did a deal this morning in, in women's health. So 
some areas that don't get that much attention and don't draw that much money. So when you do deals on either side of the table, how does this influence what your plans are for the rest of the year? Yeah, I, I was just going to comment. It depends so much in what space you play, right? I mean, how transformative your science is, obviously, but also in what space you play. And, uh, you know, if you look just in the VC space, I mean, I think 32... A billion was spent on on healthcare deals. Almost nothing, nothing on women's health. And of course, as buyer, you know we are a world leader in women's health. We've been in this space for uh, 120 years. It's something, you know, that we're very committed to because we think the unmet medical need is tremendously high. And just in the last month, we have done three deals in the in the space. I mean, with uh, EvoTech. Um, on uh, polycystic ovary syndrome, which is the leading cause of, uh, of infertility. This morning with dairy bioscience uh, in uh, non-hormonal contraceptives. And then uh, also with uh, Dewpoint, um, uh, looking at new targets in, in this space. Uh, and it's a totally different environment, of course, right? I mean, we also play in oncology and precision <laughs> oncology. And there, you know, it's fierce competition and, you know, it's all about the value. And, and I must say the conversations with companies that are committed to women's health are totally different. Um, they're often businesses that just, you know, they strongly believe in the unmet need. They want to bring it forward. They can't find any VC money. They can't find a lot of companies interested uh, in, doing, it, in uh, doing a partnership. And there it is, you know, it is a buyer's market. Um, and uh, companies as ours do not, you know, want to take advantage of that, but it's just a totally, totally different dynamic. Well, I, I kind of I, I agree with what you say, but in the, within the world of oncology that you mentioned, there are also trends. Uh, so it's not that there is a rapid uh, competition on an asset X or Y. There are trends that you can see it building over the years and if you are ahead of the curve there uh, you might benefit more than maybe others for example cell and gene therapy are two areas which have a lot of similarities you know uh, took many years to develop it uh, some were ahead of others however you can see now more and more at least in 2019 more large pharma and bigger pharma um, entering the space of cell therapy, which you would never think is happening in 2017 or 18. I can tell you when I saw the beginning of the year uh, adaptive and Roche creating a cell therapy TCR uh, deal, I was questioning, wow, is that something that Roche has decided internally? Uh, about it, or it's a, um, or it's just one case, and I'm not sure that that's uh, the case. When we look at uh, Astellas going into uh, Zyphos, into cell therapy, how are they making their inroad into cell therapy? So that's new space. Then, once you have a space, you want to expand it, so you go beyond oncology. So now cell therapy, there's been deals that were done beyond the uh, oncology world. There was, uh, you know, Vertex for diabetes, uh, uh, Parkinson disease in uh, cell therapy with Bayer, uh, your, you know, uh, for the IPSC uh, um, uh, driven cell therapy. So now, and today, this morning, we announced on, at Vida that we started a company in, in, in partnership with uh, Gilead uh, called Kaiverna, which will focus on engineered cell therapy for non-oncologic indications such as autoimmune disease, inflammatory bowel disease. So now it's taking it to uh, beyond. So while people asked about cell therapy, now is uh, moving outside oncology, but just finally is manufacturing. I think today, whoever holds the manufacturing for either cell or gene therapy, uh, is not the king, but he is, uh, has some, uh, some bargaining chip. Will it happen in the future? I don't know, because with 300, 400 companies now in the space, not everybody will rush to have a, uh, I hope, uh, will have a uh, cell therapy of his own. 
So these are trends that if you follow, you can make more sense than just run after a molecule. Well, once you get to the point where you understand how to engineer a cell to attack something, you can also understand how to stop it from attacking things Correct. as well. I mean, it's a very basic kind of thing, almost idiotically stupid and childlike, but it does work like that in, in a lot of different respects. Well, in the high once, side. Once, once you deal with all the opportunities on one side, you start to look at opportunities on the other side, the flip side of the coin. I, I am curious, I mean, Josh, I mean, you were razor focused. Uh, when you were running Loxo, and it paid off beautifully. You had a very small company. I mean, not a big headcount at all. Razor focused on an asset. Now you're switching around, and you're in charge of the whole oncology group for Eli Lilly, setting strategy from a big pharma perspective, where you've got a lot of money and a lot of deals out there that have been cooking in one respect or another. But now it seems like the key thing is focus. How do you focus around a larger strategy with more more things in play. How do you do that? Right. I mean, at Loxo, we, we put four medicines in the clinic um, and uh, around three targets, and um, they, they had their de-risking moments each, and that was very exciting. And when you look at large pharma, when you actually reduce their pipelines down to the number of assets that are approved, you can count them all on one hand. In the largest pharmas, they have a single-digit number, low single-digit number of assets. Uh, I mean, Merck is a single product oncology company today, largely. Um, and so that kind of focus, its rewards are obvious, right? Um, and so when Mother Nature offers a biologic foothold to exploit a, a clear vulnerability in cancer, I think, we think it's, in, it's incumbent to focus intently on building the best possible medicine that leaves no efficacy, durability, and safety advantage on the table rather than rushing on to the next project uh, and hoping your molecule was, quote, good enough, knowing the compromises you made along the way. And I think that model um, can be applied to large pharma across a, uh, a low double-digit number of, uh, of targets rather than the hundreds of targets that I think historically have driven the strategy in large pharma where there's a 5% PTS. We can't be smarter than the world at picking the winners. So we're going to start hundreds of programs expecting the vast majority to fail, and we're not going to really focus that intently on any of them. And, and that's how these um, systems have been built uh, in, in large industry. And I don't think, uh, at least under my leadership and shared leadership with, with the group, uh, formerly LOXO, now LOXO Oncology at Lilly, we're going to bring that kind of focus to a smaller number of projects, but really play to win in those things we commit to. Okay. Now, Vivac, cancer is the one area I think you've still stayed away from, right? I mean, there is no Oncovan out there. Yeah, there is. So I'll make a couple comments on that. I think that part of the innovation boom we have seen in the last 10 years in oncology in particular cannot be divorced from the regulatory and pricing environment we have seen that has spawned that innovative, that innovative trend. So if we want to sort of take a 10-year view, 10 years ago, investing in oncology was almost a bad word, but I think a lot of reform at the FDA, specifically in the oncology division, a lot of willingness, differential willingness of the system to pay for innovation in oncology, I think the confluence of those two factors, I think, played a big role in spawning what we have seen as an innovative boom over the last decade. The question is not about the past, the question is about the future. I think I would be looking to where we are seeing the early signals of that in areas of medical need that may threaten the system in ways that go beyond saving people at the, you know, in, in, saving lives with, with cures to cancer. I think that that would be really where we will see the pendulum swing next. And so for us, I think part of our focus has been not on trying to excel in areas where there are plenty of companies doing outstanding work already, but rather looking at some of the areas where the medical need is disproportionately large compared to the magnitude of R&D investment from everyone else. And so that included areas like urology in pulmonology, and I'm using gross terms, these are broad therapeutic areas, specific areas between them is the reality, in women's health, for example. And, and, and we put together a, a deal at the end of, that closed at the end of last year with a large Japanese pharmaceutical company where we did a it, was like a, it was a combination of a platform deal and a product deal that took a portfolio of products in, in areas of dramatic underinvestment for the rest of the industry, but which collectively comprised a growth engine that could then fill the patent cliff that, that this larger company was facing. So it's a very Sumitomo different strategy. Band. 
than a lot of these. What's that? Sumitomo Vant. S- Sumito Vant Sumito was the name. Oh, yeah. okay. It was the name of this uh, new alliance we created with Dainippon Sumitomo with Royvent, uh, and they, they wanted to buy into both of the products that we had, we had delivered close to market, but also our business model itself of continuing to hunt for assets that filled that niche. And, and they created a, a wholly owned entity, which they named in, in uh, consistency with our model, Sumita Vant, which is now carrying forward multiple products that we have, we have really turned over to them. And I do believe it's actually great that this is happening because Obviously, oncology is the second leading cause of death. It's an incredibly important space. But if you look at cardiovascular, that's the leading cause of that. And you know, respiratory disease, third leading cause. I mean, there's so many spaces where also, you know, all big pharma are really exiting. Um, and, you know, it seems that everyone is sort of, you know, going to the, to the, to the same space. So I think it's great to see innovation happening in uh, and other areas where there's really great on that medical need. And, and it's not linear in terms of the changes in these trends. I, I don't say this in a critical way, I say it in a descriptive way. I think the industry has a history of pattern following. And some people would say even behaving like lemmings, that's, that's critical, I don't mean to sound critical, I mean to be descriptive, to pattern following. And the, smart, I think the smart kind of lemmings. The, 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 yeah. the smart kind of, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. You, oh, see, you okay. see success, you double down and you, and you chase yeah. it, right? You're on the other okay. side of the table. But you know, I think that um, you know, I think that we are going. To, I think the more, more interesting question is rather than looking at the retrospective trend and seeing why something was was hot, instead of thinking about where is the need in the future that isn't being filled. I think that a lot of that is in cardiometabolic disease. I think it's in other prevalent conditions that that don't receive the current level of of R and D focus from the rest of pharma. And I think it'd be more fun to make predictions about what we're going to see 10 years from now, where, what are we going to say is the oncology or sub-oncology space of 2030 rather than sitting where we sit in 2020 today? I actually do think that, uh, I think that, I think that metabolic disease is going to be one of, those, one of those areas. I think that, look, diabetes and obesity and the complications of obesity are going to bankrupt our system sooner than the need for delivering a, genetically targeted therapy for, for an ultra rare population. And I'm not saying that's not important, it's incredibly important, but I think that society is, what is necessary will eventually be possible. And I think that is what is necessary to address today in a way that the industry has largely stepped back from thinking about in terms of basic biological approaches and I d- to make I, a difference. I do hope neurodegenerative disease. I mean, to the point that I Ari agree. was making, I, I mean, we are now using, you know, stem cells that are, uh, differentiated into dopaminergic neurons, and we're, you know, going to bring these into patients to treat Parkinson's disease. Those are totally novel approaches, and I think, you know, there's an outlook that could be really positive for that. You can't understand, though, I mean, why the larger players are running away from neurodegeneration as well as cardio and metabolics and things like that, because you run these huge studies, and then they fail. And, a lot of money. Or then they go, you know, deep diving into the data to say, well, it didn't really fail. It actually worked out. I mean, it, it is, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge area. And then you get, a, you get a, a drug like from Amarin that evidently does work and gets approved and all the rest. And who's going to buy that? I mean, it, it, it does raise a lot of interesting questions. The larger populations are the ones that are least attractive to the big players right now. And the pricing, uh, I mean, the pricing of those... Drugs. I mean, it's a totally different ballgame, right? Look, it's true that uh, that neuro disease is challenging. However, there is a backdoor to that, uh, to cracking these uh, issues, and that we never didn't mention yet on the panel after so many uh, minutes of discussion. Precision medicine. So it's here. Genomics, sequencing, all of that will create a situation by which monogenic diseases is where things are happening now. So it will be on very few patients, rare diseases, neuro and uh, metabolic diseases, as you all say. But then you'll find the principle. You'll see the genomic uh, imprint. And it will move in an intelligent way to the larger diseases. So kind of the next, you have to start somewhere. And I see it as starting from the precision medicine. And uh, in oncology, we know it, for example, that um, You know, today there are hospitals that wherever any patient with cancer goes in gets immediately complete sequencing. And the interesting fact that kind of I read is that 40% in a specific hospital 
that are sequencing these patients are deciding the patient treatment based on the sequencing and the molecular analysis of these patients, which is a full revolution. So this will carry outside oncology. Again, this is the lowest hanging food. It's easy to get money to sequence today for $1,000 a, uh, a patient, but eventually it will go down and it will move everywhere. It, it is though, I mean, like with our drug, Vitragvi, that Bayer and Loxo um, brought together to the market. I mean, it's an antrac fusion inhibitor. If you, if you do the genomic screening, you can find the patients and you have an immediate treatment, and you can save a life, but it doesn't happen, right? I mean, the, the screening is not something that you would think, you know, that it, it would be obvious that, you know, patients are going to it be will. screened. It will. We're not there yet, right? I mean, Almost. hopefully we'll, we'll get it's there. It's a payer issue. Yeah. Yeah. It's an incentives issue mm. uh, in the United States. Exactly. Uh, the medical centers you're referring to are using it as a loss leader because Absolutely. they feel like it's their scientific obligation to do it. and. They're, they're on the innovative leading edge, but, uh, and we're, we're way better off in this country than anywhere else in the world, much less, and, and it, it wouldn't take a lot of money, honestly, to transform this dynamic. Uh, I mean, in the grand scheme of healthcare spending, it's, it's almost trivial. And, and, and then we need to inc improve medical education so that people, you know, uh, who are coming up through the system are even trained in, in these lab medicine outputs. Exactly, yeah. Okay, so one of the other things that I wanted to bring up in this conversation was that among all the different things that are changing in terms of modalities and so forth, over the last few years, there's been a big regulatory change, obviously. I think the FDA has driven a lot of the added activity by the fact that they have become much more proactive. I am curious, I mean, you're beginning to see New York Times yesterday did a uh, an op-ed related to the FDA, and they, they it was, to my mind, off base in any number of different ways and also inaccurate. But on the other hand, though, it does begin to raise this issue whether there's going to be a, the pendulum is swung over here or is the pendulum going to come back at all? Now, it doesn't seem like there's any kind of near-term 2020 change in the FDA. The emphasis is on fast approvals now, faster than, than before, and they keep on speeding it up. Does anybody see any kind of a longer-term change in terms of the FDA's position on this? I personally yeah. think that the FDA will be much more engaged in the real issues, in where it is. It will, it will not sit on the top of the hill and let you know what they feel, but they will have, and they are already starting to get feedback from us, from uh, a team of experts of how best to, and to expedite drug development. So I've never seen a time like that in the last 25 years right. where uh, FDA is undeserving a New York Times article like yesterday. <clears throat> Anybody else want to talk? I, I used to work at FDA and I, I, f I follow the issues pretty closely, but I, I think the editorial you mentioned and some of the social media flow, it, it, to me, it's about, it's a very devious pre-planned attack on the agency's credibility piece. And it, with the intent of linking this to the pricing debate. So the, the idea that we're lowering the bar regulatory-wise at the same time we're, quote, overpaying. It's a very insidious, uh, policy-oriented goal among some very outspoken and well-funded critics uh, of our whole system. And I think the agency's unfairly being brought into the crosshairs. In truth, the agency is the only entity in the entire ecosystem that has unfettered access to primary data. They have the, they're the only ones who can enforce quality standards, and they're the only ones who can take a policy view over what's acceptable and what's in the interest of patients. The agency's listening more to patient groups. They're listening to the patient voice. Patients want access. They don't want truisms and platitudes about um, science and technology. They care about medicines that work, and the agency's that last moment uh, before which those become available to the American public. So I think the agency's really under unfair attack. Uh, we, we need more review divisions like oncology to, again, get a little bit, take a little risk uh, from a, a, a policy perspective and accept endpoints, accept uh, surrogate endpoints that are reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. And, and embrace a little bit of like, well, if we get it wrong, if an accelerated approval medicine doesn't convert to clinical benefit, well, we have the tools to bring it off the market. And so when, when the media points to that as a failure, to me, it's the success of the system. 
when, when something doesn't work in its confirmatory trial, well, great, we have the mechanism, we took a chance, now let's bring it back. But that does, shouldn't necessarily take seven or eight years in order to reach that stage where you can go back and say, well, did it work or, or did it not? I mean, I think everybody up here could agree that you could run through a program like that in a lot less time if the agency was more proactive. They could say, we are going to require a three-year time zone, not give them five years and then extend it in six and seven and eight, which is what happens practically every time. So there are probably some different reforms that they could make pretty easily that wouldn't cost them that much. Yeah, I mean, we, we actually see quite a bit of uh, openness uh, at the side of the agency as it relates to, you know, obviously we are a little bit of an odd industry. We're in any other industry, if you do a process over and over and over again, you get more efficient and you get, you know, to do it cheaper. But in our case, you know, it takes us 2.5 billion or so to bring something to market. It's mind-blowing and it's not getting better. Um, however, the whole digitalization that we can now bring to, you know, both drug discovery, but then also to development and going to sightless trials and virtual trials, etc. Um, I mean, it's a huge thing, of course, for the FDA to think about that, but we actually feel a lot of openness, at least, to have the dialogue in exploring new ways of, of potentially doing development in the future. So now, Vivek, we're talking about how easy it is to get an approval from the FDA. Of course, one of your companies had exactly the opposite effect, uh, opposite uh, uh, result when they went with Enzyvent with a very, with a drug for a very, what is it, like 20 patients yep. a year or something like that. So what's your perspective on this? Yeah, look, I, I think that, uh, I think, it, I think it's also a little bit gross to talk about the FDA as one entity. I think that there are certain principles that we see adopted by certain divisions, the oncology division in particular, which I think has done an outstanding job of setting a tone for innovation and innovation that best serves the interests of patients in real time as they need them. And I think that not all parts of the agency, I think, uh, embody that same that same attitude, and I, and I worry a little bit when I read about some of the public criticism that also characterizes the FDA in gross terms for actually penalizing them for one of the things that they've done really well in certain bright spots of the agency without, without remembering that this is, it, it is incoherent to drag the FDA into the drug pricing debate without recognizing that actually one of the best ways to contain drug pricing is introducing greater competition. And one of the greater ways to introduce greater competition is to bring down the time and cost and bureaucracy associated with developing new drugs. And I think that one of the things that we're seeing in this cultural moment is a general frustration and malaise with the industry, with drug pricing, et cetera, in ways that result in, in critiques that are less than coherent because some of the very critiques, I think, if taken to their logical extent, would worsen rather than help the problem. And so but let me push, back. Let actually, me push yeah. back on that a little bit because it's interesting because it gets back to this theme about how drugs are priced. And we're going to have a panel a discussion on this coming up in a little bit. But it gets back to this whole thing about whether drugs are priced according to how much it costs to develop. Well, clearly that's not the case. Drugs are priced according to what the market will bear, according to what the other drugs are being charged, for, uh, what you're charging for the other drugs, similar types of drugs, and they're being bid up and it's going higher and higher. So really the FDA doesn't seem to have any kind of impact as it relates to if you do in fact reduce the cost of development it doesn't necessarily reduce the price that they charged uh, on the market yeah I, I just disagree with that I think that I think that you obviously we're not in a cost plus industry and I don't think we ought to be but logically and, and I think market mechanisms and historical data across industries prove it the lower the barrier to introduce competition the more that buyers of the product have leverage in determining what the prices of drugs ought to be what do you think the net price of Sovaldi would have been versus what it was if AbbVie had not been on the market? And I think that if we think, and that's in, that's in the case of Hep C because it was one of the hottest areas of, of hot pricing debate, but it's, it's basic common sense that if the ultimate barrier to the introduction of new medicines is lower, there will then be new, more new medicines. And if there are more new medicines, there is more leverage on behalf of the people who are choosing to pay for those medicines, how they ultimately pay a lower price. And so I think that this is, you know, not, this is not uh, rocket science. This is the basic mechanisms of how markets work. And the fact that we're not in a cost plus industry, does, obviously we're not, doesn't mean that the costs and the barriers play no role in pricing. It's just that the mechanism through which they affect pricing is the introduction of, of competition. And so I think that there's a lot of counterintuitive frustration that is resulting, I think, I think an incoherent 
critique of FDA. When it, if, if I have a critique, I, I think it would go in a different direction to think about how we can spread the leadership that we have seen in the oncology division to really embody that spirit in the, in the line level reviewers at, at other divisions at parts of the FDA that are still operating according to a 1990s mentality. But to the point that John was making, I think the Hep C situation was a little bit specific, and you're right, hopefully we'll see that more, right, where, you know, competition plays, and, um, but it was quite exceptional, I think, and it was almost desperation on the competitors of Gilead's part that they came up with this, you know, totally different and lower pricing, right? Um, so I think you don't see that play out that often in the market, uh, but you're right, I mean, it's, it's one example where that has driven down price uh, considerably. So, Stefan, I mean, you're in this whole process of building the platform and building the company and having dozens of drugs and so on and so forth. For, from your perspective, I think it must be fairly easier now to deal with the FDA as it comes to this type of co uh, company. So, I mean, a bit as my colleagues have said, the FDA has evolved tremendously, I mean, compared to 25 years ago when I started in the industry. I think the quality of the scientific discussions, uh, the ability to engage on biomarkers, is just remarkable. Uh, I mean, you know, we have a CMV vaccine that is now in phase two. They gave us a type C meeting to discuss the phase three approval endpoint before we ever got the phase one data. And we had a great discussion, we agreed on the endpoint, and then a few weeks after we had the data and we gave them the data, which was super strong, to just give you a sense that they could have said, no, we, we're gonna talk about it later. And we made the request and they engaged with us and we had a great dialogue. So I think we're agreed that probably over the next few years the FDA is going to continue to be easier to deal with and that will drive more deals throughout the industry as a whole for more drugs? I will be careful with what easier uh, because I think they are really playing their role. I think that both the industry and the FDA has moved tremendously in terms of our understanding of the science and the biomarker and the data. So I think the dialogue is just of a different level than what it was 25 years ago. So one other aspect that I wanted to bring into this conversation, and kind of let's, let's bring it back to deal making, is that over the last few, the other thing that's changed big over the last few years is the arrival of China. You have China now as a player, uh, as, a, as a drug developer. You have China uh, playing as a deal making group. Um, they're licensing in, obviously, a tremendous amount of drugs into the country. You've got a whole creation of a whole group of companies um, that have been put together in China just, just almost overnight. It's just remarkable how fast that has changed. So when you think about China as this whole, if you think about a global plan, are, do you see companies doing a global strategy related to how they make deals for their drugs? Is there this going on, or is this still something that's relegated to a, a smaller, a minority of companies that are aware of some of the changes that have happened? Anybody want to take this one first, Vivek? I mean, you've been obviously involved in Asia for several years. Yeah. I don't have much to, to frankly, uniquely add there. I think that it's, um, I was, laughing a little bit that if there was like a Silicon Valley show, like a TV show that's like a spoof of Silicon Valley and there was an equivalent of that in biopharma today, there would be definitely a punchline of somebody asking, what's your China strategy? As something that is a, that's a trite question to ask and I don't have something particularly unique to say in response. Of course, it's a big market. Of course, we need to contend with it. Of course, doing business there is different and it is different, I can say from experience uh, in, in ways good, at, you know, in ways that are, that are good and not so good. And, presenting challenges for, for how we do business there. But um, yes, I think it's gonna be a player. Well, I started uh, kind of my uh, China expedition about uh, five, six years ago uh, when we were looking at a partner for cell therapy in China. It was very hard to find. Uh, we have uh, moved with uh, and talked with a lot of uh, parties. Uh, we eventually ended up uh, really lucky with a very credible group, uh, Fosun, uh, that part of it, a, a, a big Fosun, but Fosun Pharma, and we build a, a company uh, in Shanghai uh, with a manufacturing plant, uh, a full-fledged uh, company. So I uh, initially was there every three to six months and uh, started watching uh, the FDA, the CFDA, uh, catching up with the science. And that was a dramatic uh, experience for me because at the first time we came, we had to explain to them what is a T-cell, what is a cell therapy, what is, why are we 
confusing uh, anybody together with a uh, T cell and what's the function. Six months later, they hired several hundred employees to deal with that issue, and they were asking us about the specific anybody. It's not approved in China, so how do you use it in your, uh, in, your in vitro and in vitro assays? Uh, there would be a problem with our approval. And each time you come, you see that there is no much difference than the level of FDA today and the level of the CFDA. It's frightening, but that's really going on specifically when some of uh, your colleagues at the FDA and uh, people that we knew from different laboratories in the United States are now working at the CFDA. They went back, and they are the ones who are calling the shots. So what's the ultimate goal in China? It's probably to become an independent giant in pharmaceutical. Can they do it alone? No. And therefore, they would probably agree now to a Beijing-Amgen uh, uh, deal, but how successful it will be for Amgen, I really don't know. Now, I want to turn to you in just a second, because I know what you're going to say here, uh, but it, uh, and it's important. But I, I just want to let the audience know in a few minutes we're going to start taking questions from the audience. So um, when I get to that point, presumably we're going to lower these lights a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so I can see what's going on out there. But if you've got any questions, think about it. Think about who you'd like to ask it, that question for. So Marianne, I, I know that uh, at Bear, you, the ch whole China thing has become a, a critically important aspect of the deal-making process. So maybe you could tell a little bit more about that. Well, it, it, it's not just now, right? I mean, Bayer, and I didn't know until I joined a couple of months ago, uh, but Bayer has been in China for 138 years, which is you know, pretty mind-boggling, and had their first aspirin manufacturing plants already in the 1930s. So the relationships are really long-standing, and the, the knowledge of the market, I think, is tremendous in our organization. So we're the number three uh, multinational in China, and uh, we had, it's for Bayer actually our second biggest market, 3 billion in sales and 26% growth last year. Um, and in all the areas where we play, be it diabetes, women's health, cardiovascular, etc., we are the, the, the number one leader in, in China. Uh, so for us, we see a lot of companies that have fantastic products and that market them in the US and they market them in Europe and they think about China a little bit too late. So we really want to, you know, capitalize on that and you know invite companies to come and speak with us because we think we have tremendous capability actually to help uh, to help bring uh, assets to that market and uh, make it a success so i wanted to turn next uh, to to one other question that i really wanted to get to which is you've all got years of experience doing deals now um, you've done as i said individually and collectively billions of dollars worth of deals. So where are the problems? I mean, where are the things you say, oh, here we go again? Where are the pitfalls that where a deal goes wrong, where the, it should never have been struck, it should have, you know, it, it was the wholly wrong thing to do. Um, and, and no names or anything like that, but what are the things you just say, okay, if I'm advising somebody just getting into doing their first deal, this is what you gotta watch out for. This is the thing you don't want to do. Stefan? Oh boy, how long do you have? Uh, <laughs> I would say you need to be very clear of what liabilities you are getting into. Because once you partner an asset, it's partnered. So you have massive obligations to a partner and things are gonna change. Every time we did the deal, before signing it, we step back and we say, how are we gonna feel when this deal is gonna be renegotiated? because there's no way for the next 20 years the deal is gonna stand as is. You don't know what you don't know on both sides. And then people are gonna change in both companies. The timelines are very, very different. When you are losing money every day, you know, <coughs> we're investing $40 million a month in the business, so it's $2 million a day. Dealing a meeting by a week is painful. When you have cash coming out every day as a cash flow positive company, very different time frame. And so, you just need to be very clear what you're getting and what you are losing. And you need to be thoughtful about the trade and make sure that the upside and the downside is balanced to your liking. And, and I've seen cases where entrepreneurs just were so desperate for cash for their business uh, that they did deals that then just from the beginning like, oh, it's gonna be, it's gonna be bad. 
uh, <coughs> well, if I would, uh, I would try to think of deals that are going well or doing kind of later on going uh, somehow less than ideal, it is you need first to see the synergistic effect between uh, the two parties, what each brings, and how long does it take to get the deal? You know, if it takes you a year to, to complete a deal, is we are trying to find a way. Uh, I can tell you that uh, David Chang uh, announced today a kind of a deal of Allogene, and it took three weeks for two companies to get together. Here is what we're doing. That's our clinical. This is our size, how we can make it better bring it together, and within three weeks, we are announcing today the deal. So, uh, so this is a good deal. And when you need to expand and extend, that creates, in my mind, a problem, because the big pharma, I'm sure, is uh, looking and knows and has a database on most of the companies. So when they're approaching, they need to move on uh, relatively uh, quickly. The second one that I learned personally is integration. There are companies that are built on integrating the company that acquired and make it a success, and others that it's not in the D DNA. It's like everything else. You have experience or not. When we, uh, when we sold the um, uh, Cougar biotechnology to J&J, uh, it was like a machine. You know, they came with the Air Force, with the tanks, with this, within, within, within. Uh, no, really, you can see we have done it many times before. We know how to integrate, and the integration was so quick uh, and quite amazing. So I think that this is also counts with who, who, are you, who is your partner. Okay. We're back, and then yeah. we're going to go. Yeah. yeah, I was going to just come back to, I think, a clear-eyed thesis at the very beginning about the comparative advantage of each party. So, so I'll leave you with actually an interesting deal, and I won't tell you which big pharma it is, but there was a big pharma that, that approached us last year, and I think that there's deals that they have done that were modality specific, where they went to a partner who had expertise in a particular therapeutic modality and looked at it irrespective of target or therapeutic area or, or specific indication and really gained that expertise through modality. That's an example of a clear-eyed thesis. The same party came to Royvent, and you wouldn't come to Royvent for expertise in a treatment modality, we have none of that, but expertise in identifying unique opportunities in part enabled by our digital technology. And here, they looked at it in a different lens. And they said, you guys go out and pick a give us a therapeutic area, one of those therapeutic areas that wasn't the area of investment for the rest of pharma, even for them, and said, I don't care about the modality, assemble for us a portfolio of proof of concepts across cell therapy, gene therapy, you could have small molecules, antibodies, we don't care, and let's enter a multi-year deal where we can opt in to proof of concepts that you deliver to us, and here's a pile of cash to do it. Maybe we announce that later this year, maybe we don't, but that, to me that is an example of one company that I saw being very clear-eyed about the thesis about what the comparative advantage was with certain of their partners, and came to us with a clear-eyed view of what our comparative advantage would be with respect to them. And I think that's the formula for really a successful deal that doesn't end up in the scenario of failure that you're okay. talking about. Okay, so now's the time we turn to the audience. And now's the time we're gonna lower the lights a little bit, right? <laughs> just, just so I can see who's out there. Okay, so I, we've got some microphones out there. Any questions? We have got a question right here. We're not lowering the lights, is that right? <laughs> Yeah, hi. Uh, question for uh, Vivek. Uh, congratulations on your Sumitomo deal. Really values well what, what Hoyven does, large infusion of cash. What do you see in um, the pipeline for 2020? Do you see more of the same in terms of deals that kind of validate um, your approach to science, more IPOs, or more kind of selective acquisition of uh, assets? Sure, so we made a, thank you for that, we made a strategic decision in 2019 where, you know, at inception, I had said we're gonna in-license promising products in areas of need that others aren't focused on and go all the way and just build an alternative pharma company and build a new kind of big pharma company from scratch and just go all the way and do that. I think that upon self-reflection over the last 24 months, I think one of the things we realized was 
if we obviously look at the thing we've created, it is actually as much more a platform than it is an alternative large pharma. And by doing deals that leverage our own platform, we can actually accelerate our vision to eventually get to the place where we're taking our own products to market. And so going forward, we're going to be doing both of those things, where we'll partner in business-to-business -business deals, like we did with Sumitomo, filling gaps of other companies, use the resources, expertise, and capital that we gain from those partnerships to take a separate part of our portfolio to also, over the longer run, go all the way. So I expect to, to, see, to do more of those deals, but in supplementation with powering the rest of our business to actually launch our own products as well. Any question? Right here. Thanks. Um, very helpful comments today. I'd like to understand your views uh, from for all the panel on uh, other types of innovations such as chronic care management. So when you look at uh, opportunities to manage, for example, diabetes, what Lavango has done, do you see an opportunity for deals with those types of companies or building capabilities for chronic care management, especially given that the vast majority of healthcare dollars, as we know, are not spent on drugs but are spent on chronic care? And I think there are certain disease areas where, when you think of cardiovascular, when you think of respiratory, and ultimately where cancer is going, especially with personalized medicine, there's an opportunity for innovative business models and deals that you could do with different types of companies to get a foothold in those markets. Any, any thoughts on where we might be doing that in five years? In the interest now? of time, we might have one person take that on. Does anybody want to? Yeah, Marianne? I can I can maybe comment on that. So diabetes is obviously an, an area where we play, and you might have seen last year we announced a deal with OneDrop, uh, which is a, basically a digital platform to care for patients in the diabetes space and help them through artificial intelligence in making the right choices and help them in you know the the treatment of their disease. And that's we took an equity stake in the company and then we entered into a collaboration. Um, so those kind of steps were certainly taken. Um, and, you know, some similar um, business models actually in cardiovascular, but it is, uh, I must say, it, it's all pilots at this time. They're sort of trying to figure out how it can work, uh, and I think that's probably true for, for a lot of players in the, in the field. Okay. Another question? We got a hand right there. Uh, <clears throat> I think it's a question for uh, Stefan. Congratulations on the um, success of Moderna so far. For uh, people like us, uh, or like myself, starting a platform company now, are there particular lessons given the environment today, uh, or particular things that you would do differently than uh, what you had done you know, about a decade ago starting Moderna? Uh, the piece I wish I had done different is I, I wish I had doubled down on vaccines earlier. Uh, we were very focused on therapeutics, and we were starting to play with vaccines a bit on the side. Um, and if you look at what we know today, this is actually a great use of the technology. And so if I, have, if I had a magic wand to go back through time machine, I would kind of tell myself to double down earlier on vaccines. So another question? I think we have time for another question here. Anybody? Somebody's got a question. Okay, well, whoever you, I, I, I swear I can't see anybody. Over where? I think, I, I think I've got it here. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the panelists because for those of us who are doing or thinking about biotech deals, I found your comments to be very useful. Just thanking you. So one of the things that you talked about was uh, moving into a market where things are established, therapeutics for cancer. What do you do if you're doing something where there is no market? And so an investor asked me the question, uh, what problem are you solving for your opposite part, for your, your collaborator, for your biotech deal person? And my first thought was, I would never be so arrogant to show up in front of somebody and say, hey, dude, you're missing the boat. You need to do it, right? I just think that's arrogant. On the other hand, it's very important to spell out what you think the comparative advantage is. How would you deal with that? Thank you. I mean, it, it, 
it's very difficult for investors to model something brand new. They're, they're encountering thousands of points of information in their careers every day, and for them to think along, you, you, you know, an entrepreneur spends hundreds of hours in advance of that meeting, and you're asking somebody who spends minutes to kind of get up to speed, and, and, and that is the battle. And I think small companies have a unique ability and a unique mouthpiece to tread new ground. Uh, they can do so in medical meetings. I, I, one observation that sort of I had along the Loxo journey was uh, I used to think there were these different audiences for our data. I used to think there were physicians and there were patients and there were regulators and there were investors and there was the media and, and I kind of realized that they're, no, they're, all the, they're all one audience. And uh, when you talk to one entity, you're talking to them all. And I, th I think small, especially public companies, have the ability to use social media, use medical meetings, use um, um, paid media, uh, you, a, a lot of strategies to then, it, it's effectively a long-term medical affairs exercise is really what you're saying. And so if you're the first to have the vision, uh, you, in effect, you need to teach others, and, and eventually they'll come around, and eventually for you being first, you'll be rewarded, but the, the getting there is, is, is uncomfortable. Uh, and the getting there will always be so, and, and that's the work of it. Okay. Well, I'd like to thank the panel that came out today. It's been a great discussion. It's always one of those issues that you want to keep on going back to. It's really, it's really cool. Really appreciate the insights that you've had here today and, and for coming out.